Well, good evening and welcome to uh, Grace Bible Church on uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, downtown Main Street. I'm Jim Hayes. I'm standing in for our pastor, Pastor Brad West. He's out on a mission to Mindanao, Philippines. And uh, we've heard from him a couple of times. They're doing really well. Their mission is going along uh, as we expected it would. I'm going to look real quick to see if he's logged on or not. And I see that uh, Pastor Nestor and uh, Dede are logged on. and uh, But I don't see that uh, Pastor West is. But uh, Pastor Dede can type me a note there if you've got uh, Pastor West with you. And we'll uh, give him an opportunity to speak if he uh, decides to. We'll uh, jump right into our lesson tonight. Uh, we'll begin as usual with a moment of silent prayer so that each one uh, can uh, shift gears, get ready for the intake of God's Word, and use 1 John 1 9 to confess your sins if uh, that is needed at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the freedom to gather peaceably together to study your word so that we might grow in your grace and knowledge. We are very thankful for the uh, Bible that is passed down to us through all these years so that we have the mind of Christ available to us today intact as it was intended. We pray that our spiritual eyes will be open and our ears will hear the truth in your word. The Holy Spirit will write that truth on our soul that we might perform the task that you have set before us. We ask these things in the name of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Amen. We were talking uh, Sunday about uh, spiritual maturity and uh, prayer and the interlocking of the two. My slide started off with a confession, and we I launched right into a talk about that. Uh, and I think I omitted uh, reiterating to you that all prayer is directed to God the Father. You know, I kind of assume that, I think, uh, uh, and that's a bad assumption to make because you do hear occasionally people will pray to Jesus. Sometimes you'll hear someone praying to the Holy Spirit. We're actually instructed in the Bible to pray to the Father. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Also in confession, uh, after after the class last night, this was kind of uh, nagging at me a little bit. I didn't take time in, during the class. I want to take a little bit of time tonight to talk about it. We talk. I used uh, David's uh, Bathsheba uh, incident and the killing of Uriah the Hittite, as you're all familiar with the story. And I, I kind of uh, slid by a couple of points that are worth talking about. When we, when we talk about this, first of all, we always talk about David and, and, how, and how his he gets uh, relieved of his uh, uh, remorse by confessing. But the person who never gets talked about in this conversation is Bathsheba. And I thought it would be worthwhile for us to just spend a little bit of time reviewing the bidding on this. I think... America got led astray in 1951 by a movie called David and Bathsheba. Gregory Peck played David, and everybody knows that Gregory Peck is a straight arrow and a good guy. And uh, Susan Hayward played Bathsheba, and, uh, you know, so I think the screenwriters... Well, I know they did. They rearranged the story so that it fit their actors and it fit what they think the buying public out there wants to see. So they made it a romantic 
type situation. Uh, they make it look like, okay, you know, David, you know, passes Bathsheba on the street and they see each other. Hi, how you doing? You know, and things go along. Every time they meet, their eyes meet, you know, and a little electricity gets started. And so they basically show them as falling in love, you know, Hollywood. And that's not the way it happened. Uh, David's a king. And he's walking around on the roof of the castle there, and he looks out there, and he sees a beautiful woman that he wants, and he sends his armed guard to get her. That's the way it went down. And uh, so Bathsheba, I mean, she, she's not, uh, she's, <laughs> for all we know, she's an honorable woman and has no ill intentions whatsoever. And these armed guards show up and say, you're going with us. The king wants to see you, and uh, so that's a rape is what it really is. And uh, so, like I said, I think most of us grew up, I did anyhow, I kind of grew up with some kind of a notion that there was a romantic deal there, and uh, there really wasn't. And uh, uh, after the episode, David still doesn't care about Bathsheba at all. He sends her off, away. And... Uh, the uh, when she, she feels like she might be pregnant, uh, she lets that be known, and David sends for Uriah to come home so that he can spend the night with Bathsheba, and then they'll think it's Uriah's child. And Uriah, being the honorable man that he was, would not spend the night with his wife because his troops were fighting on the front line out in the field. And he says, I can't do this when my troops are being deprived of their families. So at this point, David, again, without any help from uh, Bathsheba, decides the uh, way out of this is to fix it so that Uriah gets killed, which he did. <coughs> so uh, David had a lot eaten away at him, as we discussed last Sunday. And uh, so confess, who did, who did he sin against? We all know the answer to that. He sinned against God. But he wronged Bathsheba. He did her wrong. And uh, even, even after he kills Uriah, uh, he brings Bathsheba into... Uh, the castle to join all of his other women. And uh, it, it is never mentioned that he has any more affection for her than any other. In fact, if you read about the, the women that we know of in the Bible that uh, David uh, had in his harem, uh, it seems that if there was one that he liked more than all the rest, it was Abigail. She was the one that he respected and and so, uh, I mean, I guess the point I want you to have in your mind is if you ever wrong someone, so you gossip about them or, I don't know, you make up your own deal. But if you wrong someone, when you, if it, ha it might not be a sin, but you, you still should go and con confront them with your apology and say, you know, I did such and such and I shouldn't have done it. This will put your soul at ease by staying at ease with another human being. This has nothing whatsoever to do with confession, if you will. Now, if it is a sin that you have also uh, undertaken there, then you have two steps to make. One step is you confess your sin to God that gives you cleansing from all unrighteousness and, as you know, it gives you the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You get filled by the Spirit who can help you with your apology that you owe this other person. Now, how nice it would have been if David had gone to Bathsheba and he said, I shouldn't have done it. I, I did it. I apologize. Uh, I'll... I don't know. I don't know where he would have gone with that. But all I'm saying is he owed her an apology. And it could happen to you. It can happen to me. 
uh, our apology to that person does not cleanse us from unrighteousness. We have to confess to the God for that, for to the Father. Again, all prayers are directed to the Father, and certainly confession is a prayer. And so I just wanted to cover that little bit of territory there, the difference between your responsibility to another person as far as an apology is concerned and your responsibility to yourself and to God for returning to fellowship by confessing your sins. Hopefully I've made that clear enough without going kicking a dead horse or anything. So the prayer is a spiritual communication system. We talked about this last uh, Sunday. Uh, we get the authority to do that because Jesus Christ is our high priest and he has made us a priest. Uh, we are all priests, every one of us, that belong to the royal priesthood. And as I said uh, last week, when we sign off on that prayer, we are signing in his name as one of his priests, as one of his ambassadors. This communication system comes into play when we pray with someone else. Like I just prayed with a group of us here together, and we call that a corporate prayer. Let me start talking about this <laughs> by talking about uh, worshiping God. Worshiping God is something that you do in your heart, your cardia. It is a thing that you do in your soul. So let's say that I want to sing a hymn and to praise the Lord. The actual sound coming out of my mouth itself is not the praise. It's a noise. It's a clanging cymbal. The praise is taking place in my heart, in my cardia, in my soul. So you can have a very good singer who is an atheist and can sing that song really well, but it is not worship. There's an aspect of taking that, those lyrics, taking those concepts and ideas in your, in your soul and believing it and rendering in awe to God those thoughts. That is the worship. And it's perfectly fine to do that with you know while singing. It it's, it's it helps you do so. I think I think it's wonderful. But I just want to make it clear that the it's still a spiritual communication system that we're working with. It's not oral. Now, we take that same song, and I want to lead you guys in singing it. Uh, we've got a complex issue here because some of you will be able to stay in step with me in your cardia and worship those lyrics. And I'll tell you, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we're singing a doctrinal song. <laughs> Because if we're not singing a doctrinal song, there's not going to be any worship taking place. If and so, there are some doctrinal songs, but even some that are like maybe 85 percent doctrinal. I have one little thing that's not too good, or whatever. Uh, a lot of times, especially if you're visiting another church and they're singing. Uh, you sing along, you you might have to get to a, a stanza that you you stop singing and and you'll say silently to yourself, "Forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do." And, you know, and you get to the, you know what I mean. And <clears throat> so, I think that uh, this this business, I just want to kind of clarify that we could have some people in here that are singing, maybe. Maybe I'm leading the song, and I, and I and I'm in. Uh, uh, we all are in. Uh, I'd say we're not. No one is carnal at the present time. Okay. 
and as we start singing along, some people might drop out, mental attitude, and they might not be singing. They may have just lost their concentration, and the rest of us keep singing, and then maybe they'll join back in later on. So that's kind of happening around through the uh, congregation uh, while we sing the song, in and out of fellowship, maybe, but more than likely losing concentration. Okay, so that that tells us a little something about uh, corporate prayer also. Same thing applies. When we're, I think our corporate prayers need to be uh, uh, pretty simple. Uh, they need to not be too involved. You want to keep everyone, and again, remember this, you are leading a spiritual communication to the Father in heaven. So don't forget that. You're leading a spiritual communication. So this is not a good time to have a uh, to preach. Too often somebody gets up to lead a prayer, and the next thing you know, they're, they're talking about the president, and they're talking about, uh, you know what I mean? It, it can go all over the place. And you have to be careful uh, to remember that you are leading a spiritual communication, and we're going to talk more about that as, as we go along here. <clears throat> An aspect of prayer is to maintain your concentration. We were just talking about that. Uh, and that is the reason that we always have a few moments of silent time before class. Yes, it's a great time if you are not in fellowship to confess your known sins and get back into fellowship. But what's more likely is you're in fellowship and you aren't quite ready to stop thinking about what you're thinking about. You're thinking about your golf game this afternoon. You're thinking about the flowers you're going to plant after church. You're thinking about, hey, you could be thinking about any of those things, and none of that is really sinful. You're not in carnality yet, but you're not with the program either. So that's that silent time is, uh, I think, a real good practice for us to maintain, and it gives you an opportunity to to get get to thinking about and we we talked last week uh, about how you can always go to a few verses. You can go to that Psalms verse that I like, the meditations of your heart, or you can go to Romans 8:28, working all things together for God's eternal glory. You can go to a number of verses. We're going to talk about some more of them today too. But get your get your mind under control of your epinosis. Not un, not allowing the world to be under control. We're not worried about the uh, football game this afternoon. We're worried about concentrating on being able to get to the task that the Lord has prepared for us later on today. It needs to be done in an air of reverence. Uh, I've enjoyed telling people when I was a little boy, my parents were not uh, churchgoers. But my grandparents were, both sets of grandparents were, and were active uh, deacons. Of, my grandfather was a deacon in the church and so forth. So I got most of my spiritual guidance from my grandparents. And so I didn't get to go to church with them all the time because we didn't live where they lived. And But when we were visiting there or when I got to spend uh, summertime there, I went to vacation Bible school and so forth, so I got to spend some time with them that way. Well... One of the things I noticed about my grandfather was how absolutely serious he was and how reverent. I mean, I was impressed that this towering man that I really looked up to and respected so much had someone that we couldn't see that he looked up to and respected maybe even more. I mean... It was obvious. I could read it on his face, his manner, and everything about it. We were going to church, and we were going to study about God. And, and he was solemn, and, and he was reverent. And so were the other adults. There was lots of reverence all around. I was impressed with that. I really was. And uh, that, that made me think, God is really powerful. God's a big thing. It's a, you know, it's a big deal in all of these adults' eyes. 
And so that's something I think that we need to pass on to our children. And it's also something that we need to remember. Let's don't get too far away from reverence. It has an important place in our lives. And that brings me back to worship because in order to get that position in your soul where you are going to worship, you need to be having your epinosis in control of your stream of conscience and you need to be reverent and thinking about the magnificent God of the universe that you're here to study and worship. These are mental attitude states to get you going. Okay, I've got a word written down here to talk about, and that's repetition. And uh, there are two words that, to me, uh, don't quite mean the same. Uh, uh, and I can only think of one of them right now. Repetition is it. <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, persistence. There's a difference between <laughs> being repetitive and being persistent. Uh, to me, uh, repetitive has a connotation of like a machine at work. It's repetitive. A sewing machine's needle going up and down. That's a, that's a mechanical repetitiveness. Whereas uh, the... Uh, Persistence, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Where the persistence has uh, a connotation of a of a human being that is genuinely concerned and consumed with something. Uh, you take a a sports team, you see persistence there as a, 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 when they are constantly striving for that. Uh, perfect. They persistently that we're going to get it. We're going to get a goal. We're going to get a goal. That's persistence, and that's what we need in our spiritual life, I think. Uh, and it's true in prayers. So if you're persistently paying, praying for something, I think you're in good shape. I think it's a, a matter of fact. I, I go so far as to say it's probably required. If you're, but see, we're back to your mental attitude. We're back to having the right frame of mind as you're putting this stuff together. And we're going to cover some more about frames of mind here. And uh, I think it'll help you decide whether you're being repetitive or being persistent. An example of repetitive would be some churches have mantras. Like... Uh, Everybody makes fun of the Catholic Church. I'm sorry. I, I apologize ahead of time. I don't mean to throw rocks at them. They're they're welcome to do what they believe is right. But this business about giving me uh, 200 Hail Marys, uh, that's a repetitive. And not only is it repetitive, it's legalistic. It's as if the action of doing 250 Hail Marys are going to do something for your spirituality. It's not. God is the only one who's going to affect your spirituality if you need to get back in fellowship god puts you back in fellowship when you confess you don't get yourself back in fellowship by mowing the lawn or saying a hundred dale marys that's you working for your own um, experiential sanctification and you cannot do it so you can also get into a rut and I'll tell you the one that is easiest for me to get into. I, I've been working really hard on it maybe the last 10 years or so. I don't know. Yeah, I've thought about it off and on over my life, but uh, it's an easy rut to fall into. And that's saying grace when it's time to eat. Uh, it is so easy to get into a, into a rut right there where you've got your, the grace that you always say. You always say that, and pretty soon you're not, you don't even hear yourself say it. You know, you know what I mean? And uh, that's being in a rut. So try to guard against that. Uh, in the case of uh, saying grace, the, there are two things that, that uh, you want to do. A, you want to be thankful for your food. B, you want it sanctified for your nourishment. 
That's it. That's it. This is not a good time to launch into uh, uh, some long-winded prayer where you're preaching to the people. Everybody's sitting there wanting to eat. And if you start preaching, pretty soon they're going to all be out of fellowship. So uh, I think saying grace is a real challenge. So you got you got to challenge yourself to keep it fresh in your mind. I'll tell you another place that you can get into a rut, and that is the, the Lord's table, having the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever your church calls it. Don and I visited some friends uh, that took us to their church, and their church does communion every Sunday. And they do it without much fanfare, too. They, they don't talk too much about what the elements stand for. They just come in and pass the plate, and everybody does it and uh, as a regular thing. And I'm thinking, they're in a rut. They're in a routine. They're not thinking about what they're doing, you know. And uh, the, uh, they may even be unworthy. We don't know if they've had an opportunity or a reminder to be... Uh, cleanse of all unrighteousness so um, those are those are traps that you can fall into I really like the way our pastor Wes we have communion once a month and one of the reasons we don't do it more often is so that it's not just a ritual you don't want it to be just a ritual you want it to be special and so I, I really like the fact that we do that and we talked, I think it was about two weeks ago when we were talking about Passover, that uh, remembering in, in, instead of uh, looking forward to a Passover, we, we know that Passover happened almost 2,000 years ago in A.D. 30 when Christ was our perfect lamb and was sacrificed for our sin. So Passover is a done deal. We remember that, and we remember it monthly. He doesn't tell us how often. He does say, as often as you do it, do this in remembrance of me. And so you should not exceed your capability to seriously remember what Christ did on the cross. His person, uh, his body, and the blood, represented by the cracker and the juice. So... Those are a couple of places where we can fall off the log and get uh, in a rut and uh, lose track of what we're doing by just being repetitive instead of being uh, persistent. What we want is persistent worship and persistent uh, thanking uh, uh, for our perfect Passover. The, uh, I think we ought to also speak of our ability to do these things. Before salvation, first of all, it, it, this, we're talking a lot about epinosis in the soul. And we, as we think about these things, we are under the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's walking around in our soul right now, every one of us, and he's picking up epinosis that we've got stored up there and he's helping us tie it all together this is what you would call having the word of god richly dwell in your soul when you've got the holy spirit involved in your understanding that's richly dwelling that those ideas are richly dwelling within you before you're saved your your faith is constant has to be concentrated on salvation the work of christ on the cross after your salvation, we have this we have this growing thing that we do where we no that's not what I wanted to show you <laughs> but we, well, I will show it to you that's a good thing to show. I was just talking about this. Here's some persistence. Psalm 5.3, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. 
In the Hebrew, when you have a phrase that is repeated like this, it means to bring extra attention to that phrase. A modern pastor who has studied Hebrew would probably translate this, morning after morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. And that's persistence. Here's a person that's got their mind right, and they are humbly going before the Lord morning after morning. And, uh, and I had this verse in here to, to remind me to make that point. I offer it to you now. And here's what I thought I was going to be referring to. Uh, I'd already gotten to this without that previous slide. This is Jacob's ladder right here. And uh, you can see on the left the unbeliever. Here's the gospel. When he has faith alone in Christ alone, he jumps up the next step, and he's got that hope number one in his rearview mirror now. He goes over towards the right, and hope number one has become a blessed assurance. And while he's going across to the right there, he is coming to Bible class. He, she is coming to Bible class, and they are learning the mind of Christ and growing uh, in the grace and knowledge because as they improve their capacity for receiving blessings, they start getting them. They improve, improve their capacity immensely when they accepted Christ as their Savior. They immediately got the filling of the Holy Spirit. They got a great big tool uh, workman there to work in their lives. And they also got the grace apparatus for perception. So they're taking all this doctrine in and they're understanding with their pastor's help and their congregation's help and they're growing in grace. And they've got uh, hope number two there. They, that's that they will reach spiritual maturity. And as we discussed Sunday, this is worth repeating. With adequate spiritual growth, learning about God's word, you become spiritually mature you become a super grace believer and you continue growing in super grace until you eventually hop up the on the level of the third hope you don't actually have the third hope achieved until after you die that'll be at the bema seat where you have the judgment seat of christ I've got a note down here about length. I've already kind of talked about it, and that is don't make your prayer unnecessarily long. Uh, there's even a, a few verses in the Bible that tell you don't preach like the Gentiles do with a bunch of words, thinking that a bunch of words is going <laughs> to get to me. <laughs> so don't be preachy. I would say when you believe the prayer, you need to be able to say that you believe it. And you'll recall that the Hebrew word, amen, means I believe it, or so be it. So when you get to the end of your prayer, or actually as you're, as you're praying it, if you come across something that you don't think you can believe, then you're, it's not, it doesn't belong in your prayer. When you say, Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? You know that that ain't going to happen. You don't believe you're going to get that Mercedes Benz. But if you say, Father, I really want to go to this Bible class every Wednesday night, and I can't get down there unless I can find a way. I need transportation to Bible class. And you persistently pray for that, I, I guarantee it's going to be answered. You stay in fellowship and you're persistent about that need. That's the kind of thing that I think is going to happen. It might take a while. For one thing, this might be a test for you to see if you are persistent enough. But that's, that's what we got and that's what we work with. There's uh, Matthew 21, 22 says, In all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's what we were just discussing. And uh, there's, 
You know, earlier we were talking about um, uh, the I, the difference between confessing and apologizing and so forth. Uh, I think there's something to be said about this uh, believing too. Uh, if there's a there's a quality of believing that is what we'll have to call knowledge, like there's a quality of hope that's not wish, it's assurance. We've talked about this before, and. Just as a wish turns into a blessed assurance, uh, I think uh, there's a, a, a belief that has a connotation of wishiness to it, and there's no room in your prayer for that it, in, or in your soul. The belief has to be an assuredness, and that has to be based on what? Your knowledge of the Word of God. So you, you can't kind of be too fuzzy on the edge there and uh, think that you talk yourself into believing something and uh, be very serious when you're searching your own soul about your belief and uh, I think uh, you'll be able to use this verse whatever you pray believing will be answered in one of those four ways that we talked about last week I'd like to remind you of uh, 1 John 5.14. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> this ties into what I was stammering around with just a minute ago, and that is your knowledge. You need a knowledge of God's will to help you with this belief system that we were just talking about. So it's a combination of knowing God's will, knowing God's word, and believing. And knowing God's will, you say, well, how am I going to do that? Well, that's the title of this lesson, <laughs> Prayers and Spiritual Maturity. The only way you're going to know God's will is by studying the mind of Christ. You're going to have to study your Bible. You're going to have to attend Bible class. And you're going to get to the point in your life where twice a week isn't enough. Wednesday night and Sunday morning won't get her done. You're going to have to study more often. And you're going to be looking around and finding all kinds of resources to help you do that. But if you will continue studying, remember... Every one of those stages of life that we went through, I guess it's been about 10 days ago now, uh, the X, Y, and Z radicals, every one of those had a capacity which was governed by the amount of doctrine that you have in your soul. So if you will study and grow in grace, uh, then your capacity for receiving blessings increases. And part of that is your understanding God's will. You will also, through the help of the Holy Spirit, he's teaching that all that richly dwelling that you're doing right after you confess and are trying to isolate and forget and move out by means of the Holy Spirit, all that richly dwelling is going to end in you slowly becoming aware of the will of God for you. You're going to be asking for that kind of knowledge, and I'm getting ahead of myself, I think. Let's... Uh, Press on, but I think everything that we've talked about so far here underscores the last line on the slide here, which is pray without ceasing is the way you live the Christian life. And we've already talked about this. As you grow in the grace and knowledge, your capacity for blessings increase. 
We talked about how you're going up this uh, blue line right here. And uh, you are going to, I think, your grace orientation being satisfied that believing that God's grace is sufficient for you, being oriented to the fact that your blessings increase as you grow spiritually, your doctrinal orientation, you start realizing that, yeah, I've got to learn more doctrine. I, I, I have to study more, go to class more. My personal sense of destiny, I, I, I actually see myself someday I'm going to be standing before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. You've got to see that in your mind. That's out there on your spiritual horizon. And when it is and you're, and you're seeing yourself rely on God's grace, when you're seeing yourself using doctrine, and <clears throat> this is something that Pastor Theme used to talk about that really impressed me a lot. He said, you know, if you have nothing but worldly viewpoint in your mind, if all you ever do is watch TV and read the newspaper and listen to the radio, when you talk, that's what's going to come out of your mouth, the stuff that you've been hearing. You'll, that'll be your vocabulary. That'll be your norms and standards. <clears throat> when you start learning the Word of God, you start picking your vocabulary up out of the Bible. You start having your norms and standards conform to the norms and standards that you've been te taught in, in Bible class. Now when you open your mouth, you'll actually start saying things that sound doctrinal. Wow, imagine that coming out of me. So... <clears throat> you'll start seeing this in yourself and you'll start wondering, well, I wonder what, what God would think about this. Well, how does this look through God's eyes and so forth? That's when you're beginning to see yourself be concerned about your own grace orientation and your own doctrinal orientation. You start seeing yourself becoming spiritually mature when you understand that everybody on this earth is a child of God and that Christ died on the cross for every one of them, not just you, but for all of them. And when you are able to allow God to work through you and distribute your blessings to all the people around you, then you are up in the spiritual believer category. You're, you're a super grace believer. That is called unconditional love. And <clears throat> if you can say a prayer for someone that you don't like, that's unconditional love. You don't have to like them. You have to be able to see it through God's eyes. And how did God see it? Well, he loved them enough to give his only begotten son. Try that one on for size. So it, it's just, uh, this is, spiritual maturity is so much a matter of becoming mature as a Christian. And I think that the, the big one, the big one for you to watch for is that one right there. Unconditional love for man, mankind. And you, I, I've been taught and I believe it. You don't, you can't do that until you understand your personal love for God. And that's when you are able to say, not, not love like we think of love, but love like his integrity, his ten attributes, his unconditional love for us, the fact that he, in Gethsemane, he said, if I don't have to take this cup, please take it from me, but not my will, Father, but yours. And he went to the cross for us. That is the kind of love that we're talking about. It's generally referred to in the Bible as agape love. It's the sort of love that we do not generate on our own. I don't believe. It's the sort of love we have, remember, at the moment of salvation, we got a little bit of God's, well, we got God's righteousness 
I say a little bit, it's because we can't manifest very much of it. But the Holy Spirit, as we are growing in grace and knowledge, can manifest more and more of that. We become more Christ-like. That is what we're supposed to do here on this earth, is become more Christ-like. And it's taking a look at the big picture. That's, that's the only reason we even exist. So as the Holy Spirit is able to manifest God's righteousness in us, we have to have a lot of doctrine for that to happen, and we have to be in fellowship, we have to be able to abide, then the Holy Spirit is able to manifest enough of that righteousness that we can share that back, we can reflect it back to God, and we can share that with the rest of mankind. When you can do that, and you keep asking yourself, every time you fly off the handle at someone or someone gets to you, say, okay, I need to work on this a little bit. <clears throat> and you'll get better and better at it. But as I, I think we mentioned last Sunday, if you don't practice it, you won't get better at it. You've got to start trying to give these people a look through God's eyes. You can't just get mad at them and walk off. You have to, you have to make that effort internally up here to extend to them unconditional love. And that's not because of who they are. It's because of who you are. It's because of God inside you that you can give them that love. It's not because they're good. It's the same way he loves us. He doesn't love us because we're good. He loves it because of his own righteousness. <clears throat> this is a big concept to try to try to hammer down, but keep working on it. If you don't have it yet, keep working on it. Those of you who are super grace, ultra super grace believers are already understand what I'm talking about for sure, and you're ready to get to that Bema seat. And light that fire. Get rid of all that wood, hay, and stubble, and look at that mountain of gold, silver, and precious stones that remain. Philippians 4 6 is a great verse. You've all used it many times, I know, or cited it. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God the Father in heaven. I'm going to leave this slide up there. I, I, there's a, a real good doctrinal pastor that I enjoy studying with uh, sometimes. Maybe once a week or so I'll go and look and see what he has to say. If I'm, if I'm studying some, and uh, his name is uh, Bill Winstrom. I want, to, I want to read you his exegesis of this verse right here. I'm going to leave it up here so you can see the verse while I read his exegesis of it. First of all, this is uh, Paul talking to the uh, congregation, the Philippians. I'll give you a head start here. Be, that's the verb to be, and it's the imperative mood. And it's present tense. It means right now. Do it. Okay. It's, so here, here's the way Pastor Winstrom exegetes this verse. At this very moment, all of you, stop continuing to be anxious about absolutely anything, but rather concerning anything at all by means of reverential prayer in the presence of the Father and by means of petition accompanied by the giving of thanks let your specific detailed request be repeatedly made known in the presence of the Father. I love it. Thank you, Pastor Winstrom. James 1.5 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, 
and it will be given to him. And this is something that we're getting in phase two. We are getting wisdom, and it is being composed of the various doctrines uh, that we have learned, our epinosis. The stronger our epinosis becomes, the more the Holy Spirit has to work with in our toolbox, and we slowly uh, gain divine wisdom, not worldly wisdom. Colossians 1.9, we've all talked about a number of times. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, this is Paul uh, writing to the church in uh, Colossian, Colossae. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, is this not a good prayer for us to pray for each other? Isn't this wonderful? This is one that you can pray for your parents can pray for their children. The children can pray for their parents. I mean, we can pray this for everyone on our prayer list. The concept is exactly what our communication with God the Father in heaven is there for. And how do we receive this when other people pray that we get this knowledge of his will which we've just just talked about was very important for us to gain that will. We increase our capacity by studying the Word of God. Matthew 6, 11 says, Give us this day our daily bread. I like to talk about this just a little bit because I used to think of uh, uh, getting food when I saw this, you know, physical food. But then I learned that uh, daily bread really is everything, physical and spiritual, that you need today to do God's will for you. So it's something that we, this is a legitimate prayer. Give us this day what we need to do your will And part of that is the knowledge, the wisdom. So you get spiritual and physical blessings out of this. Very important. Good verse to have. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And we've been talking about the anxiety uh, that we're not supposed to have and we shouldn't have any at all for anything, as Pastor Winstrom said. But look, this is the reason here, too. He, he has arranged for this because he, he cares for you. He cares about your spiritual well-being. Another thing that we can need to pray for, for all kings and all who are in authority over us, that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. <clears throat> so when you're praying for the president of the United States, this is your prayer. We need to be able to meet like we are right now in tranquil and quiet life (laughs) to do what we're doing in all godliness and dignity. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. And this is a good prayer for us to pray for our pastor, West, who is over in Mindanao right now. You see, this is uh, Paul again talking to the people in uh, Thessalonia, and he's asking that they pray for him and, and Timothy because uh, they're trying to spread the, world, the word just like they did when they were back there in Thessalonia. You see that? And that's what Pastor West is doing right now. He's spreading the same word that he has spread with us now over in Mindanao. So this is a good prayer for us to use for our pastor. This is this is this is the big test right here that uh, Jesus passed uh, very easily. He didn't get mad at the people driving nails in his wrist, putting him up on the cross. He was concerned about their spiritual well-being. 
ask for their forgiveness because they are know not what they do. Uh, this is one I like. Matthew 6 tells us when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door. <laughs> That means get rid of all those worldly thoughts and pray to your Father who is in heaven and is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, this underscores the fact that we're praying to our Father. And this is such a good verse. We drop down blow it this is you'll recall it's called the lord's prayer but it really isn't it's uh the apostles prayer this is jesus teaching the apostles to pray so pray in this way our father that's our father in heaven who is in heaven hallowed be your name there is some worship and some reverence taking place that we talked about earlier your kingdom come, they're praying that his kingdom will come and that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we've been talking about a lot today. We've got to learn some about his will in our life so that we can be more specific in our individual prayers. Give us this day our daily bread. We just talked about that verse. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Uh, this is important uh, concept you know jesus is teaching the apostles this as we also have forgiven our debtors he's he's assuming that they have they, I, that's what passing we also have forgiven our debtors so he assumes that we are uh fast to forgive uh, people who transgress against us And do not lead us into temptation. The real good exegesis of this is, first of all, God never tempts you. He does not. He doesn't lead you into temptation. What this is talking about, the, the good exegesis of this is that your old sin nature leads you into temptation. Your old sin nature tempts you. And he is asking for protection against the old sin nature, protection against me leading myself into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And the last line there is not in the real early transcripts. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Uh, so it's in some English translations and not in others. It's in the King James, so a lot of people learned it this way. And some of the newer translations that have uh, uh, a stronger attachment to the uh, earlier manuscripts, so you'll notice that they leave that line off. I, uh, I've come to the end of uh, the things I want to say. I could ramble a little bit, and I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come together and study your word. We ask that we will become more attuned to the leading of the Holy Spirit we know that it is never a question of whether he's leading, only a question of whether or not we're following. Give us the, the ability to discern